Hi there, I'm Cassandra. In this video, I'll share ways that you can start saying yes to your homestead dream and live a farm fresh life without land or livestock. How? Because that's exactly what I'm doing in a townhouse in the city. In between my nine to five, an hour or two on weeknights and a bit more on weekends. So if you're currently in an apartment, tucked in a townhome or somewhere on the path to pursuing your farm dream, welcome. It's so nice to meet or see you again, fellow homestead dreamer. This is episode three in a series where I take you around my kitchen, garden, and life to show you doable projects and steps you can take towards starting your homestead dream wherever you are. I'll share easy and delicious food preservation recipes for busy cooks, DIY fertilizers you can make using your kitchen scraps, books I'm reading, equipment I've thrifted or purchased, and other tidbits along the way. A farm dream is a journey, and I'm here to show you how to turn your waiting room into a classroom. Let's start. A homestead of any size can make it a point to maximize the use of resources you already have and to be intentional about not letting organic matter leave your property. An easy first step is to skip the trash can and start burying your kitchen scraps directly in the ground. Within a few weeks and over time, you'll build your soil with rich organic compost and attract worms and their nutrient-dense castings. As a result, you'll create the perfect environment for your plants to thrive. For complete details on how to get started, check out my kitchen scrap composting video for small spaces. Commercially sourced fertilizer, organic or not, is a reoccurring gardening expense that can easily be eliminated using kitchen scraps or the grocery store. Case in point, fish emulsion, a fast acting fertilizer that won't burn your plants. In stores, it's at the pricier end of fertilizer purchases, but it costs just a few dollars to make it home. To make, simply repurpose a container and add a combination of fish scraps, including the bones and head if you have it, or use herring and forage fish like sardines, mackerel, and anchovies. Next, add leaf litter and fill the container with water. Set outside and shake every few days for three weeks. Then it's ready to be diluted and used. And don't throw out those banana peels. They're a great source of potassium that will give your fruits and veggies strong roots and help your roses and other flowering plants. Sure, you could make banana peel tea, but I've got an option that may provide more convenience. First, gather your peels. You can collect and freeze your peels as you use them, or you can peel ripe ones in bulk by slicing and freezing them in snack-sized portions to add to your morning smoothies. Once you have a few peels, roughly cut them into one inch pieces because you're going to dehydrate them to make into a shelf-stable potassium plant powder. And might I add that as your bananas are dehydrating, they will release an intoxicating sweet aroma that can't be beat. After the peels are dark and crisp, pulse them into a powder-like texture. Store them in an airtight container that you can use to scoop into your watering can or sprinkle around the base of your plants as needed. Now, if you're looking for the ultimate fertilizer, consider starting a worm bin to compost your kitchen scraps. These creatures look tiny, but worms have powerful digestive systems that will give you worm castings, and castings are significantly more nutrient-dense than regular backyard compost. The great thing about a worm bin is that you can cheaply make your own to accommodate your budget and space. If you're in an apartment, no problem, use stackable plastic worm bins or rubber totes. Worms instinctively start and stop multiplying depending on the size of their environment, so things won't get out of hand. I'll include a video card to show you how easy it is to make your own worm bin composter. Full instructions are also at my blog, becomingafarmgirl.com. Now, this is just my opinion, but an overlooked skill in creating a sustainable food system, knowing where your food comes from, and having control over what ingredients you determine to put in and keep out of a recipe is canning. 
stick with me. Like most folks, I never tasted or was even interested in home canned anything until I started a few years ago, so I get your hesitation. But now that I can a number of pantry items, I know that it's increased my ability to eat local, support my county's farmer's market, capture seasonal flavor, reduce packaging waste, and eat better because I can preserve and stock fresh ingredients right from home. A few weeks ago, I made sweet and spicy onion jam, which is an excellent sandwich condiment perfect on pitas, homemade subs, wraps, burritos, and tacos. It's also a quick and delicious no-fuss option for your charcuterie board with spreadable cheese and crackers. You can print the recipe from my blog or watch the full video in my canning recipes catalog. This jam is a must for savory meats. I love adding it to my grilled steak pitas. or as a quick topping over pork chops and chicken. Another one of my canning favorites that I've shared is sweet balsamic and onion rosemary jam, which is a highly versatile ingredient in my pantry. This easy recipe captures caramelized onions that marinate in the rich and deep flavor of balsamic, the sweetness of brown sugar and honey, and a balance of wine and vinegar with a delightful undertone taste of fresh rosemary that I harvested from my winter raised bed. Oh, this jam is just great, y'all. I love adding it to a turkey bacon avocado sandwich on ciabatta to take things over the top. or to dump in an easy meatloaf where all I have to do is add an egg, breadcrumbs, and stir, along with all the other ways I shared in the video. But let's not forget about the carrot cake jam we made, which is a mildly addictive one pot savory recipe you can preserve using a simple water bath. You'll enjoy this at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, as well as for dessert. If you need to freshen up breakfast favorites, here's a tasty way to do it. This is literally carrot cake in a jar. Try it spread on top of bacon and goat cheese stuffed chicken. Oh, delicious. And as a glaze on your dinner ham. These are of course just some of the ways I shared how to use this jam, so check out that video recipe next. The jam has a chewy full body from the pineapple and chopped dates, an eclectic mix of sweetness from the pears, brown sugar, and honey, along with the warm and fuzzy feeling spices we added like cinnamon, cloves, and cardamom. allows my family and I to eat items that I know where they come from, whether my backyard or the family-owned farmer's market I've gone to for years. I truly feel that canning allows us to eat farm fresh every day at a fraction of the cost. This past winter, I became even more intentional about cooking with only seasonal fresh foods. The result was an enjoyment of hearty soups and flavors that really make me appreciate seasonal taste at its peak. I shared three of my favorites with you, a creamy and savory potato choke al forno, black eyed pea and collard soup, and a nutritious Brussels sprouts and cabbage soup for you to enjoy. Check those recipes out later. If you're a small space grower, one of the books I'd recommend checking out is Kitchen Garden Revival, a modern guide to creating a stylish, small-scale, low-maintenance edible garden by Nicole Burke. This book guides you through every aspect of kitchen gardening from design to harvest, but even more, it reads like I'm talking to your friend. She rarely uses technical garden jargon lingo, and if she does, she always simplifies explanations. That's what I like about this book. Plus, it's just beautiful, right? 
Blue Ribbon Canning by Linda Ament is one of many canning books I enjoy. That's probably pretty obvious by all the tag pages. This book provides large, colorful illustrations, wonderful stories, and over 100 recipes to round out your preservation pantry. Organic Vegetable Gardening by Time Life is another one of my favorites. Now, my copy was a pre-loved book that I came across at a yard sale, but it's a favorite of mine because it provides so many illustrations, charts, and graphs that immediately provide an answer to a variety of backyard gardening operations from seed starting through harvesting or identifying pests and disease in your soil. Right at 170 pages, it feels like an approachable encyclopedia. I've highlighted, underlined, and referenced this book many, many times. If you'd like to check out any of these books, I've included links below. They'll make great additions to your home studying library. My gardening goals for this year are all about high density gardening and integrating early and late varieties of crops so that I always have something growing and something to harvest. If you'd like some ideas of what to grow for your small space with varieties that are great for vertical structures and containers, be sure to check out my seed haul. Instead of forking out money for even a moderately priced grow light, you can start your spring and summer garden for pennies by winter sowing in milk jugs. Winter sowing is the process of placing seeds in closed containers to create a mini greenhouse that is kept outdoors. It's an especially enticing method for those of us that don't have room for sowing indoors or prefer to avoid expensive grow light purchases and still grow from seed. Winter sowing allows seeds to get better germination rates, is excellent for cool season herbs and vegetables, and is inexpensive. I also have a video showing you you exactly how to start. Having the right tools is essential, but you don't need to spend a fortune. I encourage you to buy secondhand, but don't be afraid to purchase items if you've thoroughly reviewed them and it will make your work safer, more efficient, or enjoyable. Case in point, canning jars. I buy them both used and new, but recently came across over five dozen for $30. Unreal, I know. I was also able to thrift a water trough that yes, I intend to repurpose as a raised garden bed for pennies on the dollar at just 20 bucks. And I took advantage of a pre-spring sale and finally made the plunge to purchase not one, but two green stalks so that I could get more yield from my deck space using the same amount of real estate. Finally, I came across a brand new in-the-box bed that can also function as a greenhouse for $40. Now all I have to do is just figure out how to put this thing together. To get more homestead inspiration, consider subscribing and joining me here weekly. I'll see you in my kitchen or garden soon. Take care.